Henry, the philosophy of materialism that only the physical is real and nothing else but the physical truly exists is a philosophy that, as a trained scientist, I have been taught to believe and appreciate, although internally within me, I've always hoped for something more, although my training has led me to believe that such hope is a, is, is a wan one at best. You've talked about something called quantum interactive dualism, and I really want to find out what that is because maybe it can defeat materialism. Did you really mean to say exist or do something? Because um, I think most people would say that thoughts exist, and the conceptual idea of material universe, I mean, that's billiard balls bouncing off each other, and the field has a certain value at each point. And uh, within that conceptual structure, you don't see anything that uh, resembles a feeling or a, a thought or an idea. All you have is just something that's described completely in, in material terms. So uh, I think most people would say that you do have feelings, and logically a feeling is, is not contained in the idea of, of the physical world. In fact, the way uh, Newton set up his uh, physical world, the what Descartes had called the, the, uh, the, the res cogitan, I mean, the, uh, the, the realm of thought and uh, ideas, just was not part of the structure at all. And it's, so it's logically outside. And, well, I think uh, but, yet, but then let's, most people think it exists. Well, I, I, I'm not sure what we, what, first of all, what most people feel or think doesn't make it right. People thought the earth was flat. People thought that there were spirits and trees and who knows what. So w w what I'm concerned about is what's real, not what people think. And what science has shown is that a lot of the feelings that we have are just a result of brain functions in different ways. You, if you have a feeling that you, you see so-called stars because somebody hit you on the head, is because you had a, a brain, some kind of trauma. Well. There's no you press on your eye. You see a color because uh, this, is, this is a physiological effect. No, but there's there's no logical connection between the feel. You know, in in brain physiology or neurophysiology, you're talking about relationships between physiologically described things. Yes. And uh, but the fact that uh, a star appears or something like this is an empirical fact. But there's no logical uh, reason that that experience should be associated with this particular physiological activity. So I think you have to distinguish the idea of, of just the existence of an experience. There's no logical reason for the experience to exist because a certain physiological activity occurs within classical mechanics. Now, we have this, this causal uh, uh, linkage between things that happen and things that we experience in terms of uh, doing things to our brain or a body that causes different things, we have, experiences to be, to be sensed. Um, there are certainly correlations between your thoughts and what's going on in your brain. Everybody agrees to that. Right. And, uh, but I'm just trying to distinguish the word exist from the word causal connection. I'm trying to distinguish those two because... Okay. Uh, I think the important thing is the causal connection between these two. Is there a causal connection? And within a classical worldview, there's the physical description by itself, without ever talking about a field or a star or something like this, is already causally complete, and there's no room for, for a conscious experience to enter in. And this is the argument, this is exactly the argument that many scientists use to show that there is nothing but the physical. I mean, that is the materialistic argument, that, that, the, that the, the material world is a complete system. You don't need anything else. And causally. Can, causally. It's a complete system causally, right, and right. it all works together well. Right. And out of this, for some reason, we, 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 we think we have a feeling or a sensation of color and whatever, but I mean, it's just the product of this 
physical world all working together. Well, John Searle calls this the idea that, the, that just like the liver excretes bile, the brain excretes consciousness. Yeah, I've heard it with kidney and urine, but that's, yours is kidney. more polite. <laughs> uh, maybe it was the other way around. But in any case, William James, in fact, as, as far as the kidney and the bile, that's, that was his example. And he said there's a huge difference, of course, between these two. They're not analogous at all because the bile is described in the same physiological terms and it has an effect. Whereas the conscious experience is not described in terms of positions of particles. It's described as an experience. It's described in a totally different term. So, there's not a good analogy there between the brain excreting consciousness and the liver excreting bile. There, there seem to be two quite different things. And uh, you know, I can almost argue it both ways. But let, let's let's continue the process. In any I... case, the main thing I think is is the issue of causal connection. I mean, I think most. I would like to say that. I think most people will admit that you have conscious experiences and nobody can understand why a conscious experience is exactly the same thing as a motion of particles moving around. Fair enough. So, Fair enough. So there's a, there's a mystery there and yeah. let's say that both of them, certainly experiences exist, certainly brain activities uh, exist and uh, so they both exist. The question is, is there a causal connection between them and if so, what is it and how does it work? And, According to, if you believe classic mechanics, then there's just no room for a causal connection. And materialism is absolutely right. If you believe that materialism is right, if you accept that, then um, there's no causal role for consciousness to play. And, and therefore, if, if classic, what you're saying, I think, is if classical mechanics is the only system, then materialism is the right philosophy and that only the physical world exists and consciousness plays no role. Well, you keep saying exist, I would say. Let's talk about the causal connection. Causal connection, and, okay. And, uh, okay. So, if you accept classical mechanics and you believe it is the, is the, the ultimate truth, then consciousness does not really play a, a causal role. Fine. It's what they call epiphenomenalism. Right. And uh, consciousness doesn't do anything. So, but why do you believe classical mechanics? Why should a brain scientist believe classical mechanics? If you look at what's going on in your brain, a lot of what's going on in your brain has to do with nerve impulses, and we have uh, uh, nerve terminals that uh, sure. calcium ions flow in, and, and they release neurotransmitter, and all these things that uh, neuroscientists talk a lot about, neurophysiologists. And at this lowest level, you've got to treat these quantum mechanically. That can actually be shown. These these ion channels are so narrow that the uncertainty principle causes these things to flare out after in the, the brain. Time. Right. In the, so you're going to have neurons. uncertainty at the bottom level, and if you have uncertainty at the bottom level, the way nonlinear systems work, you're going to have huge uncertainties when it bubbles up to a macroscopic level. So quantum mechanically, quantum mechanics says you've got to treat the brain as a quantum system. Now, it's true that neuroscientists have, think they have good reasons for, for understanding it in classical terms. But that can be understood within quantum mechanics, why classical ideas work as well as they do. But the underlying issue still remains about the causal connections. Once you've gotten rid of classical mechanics and say it's no longer valid, then you don't have a good reason to say that consciousness cannot do anything. And in fact, if you look at quantum mechanics, you find that an essential element of quantum mechanics is an input from the psychological realm into the physical realm. And that's what Bohr calls the choice on the part of the experimenter as to what. So materialism says no matter what you call consciousness, it exists, doesn't exist, it in fact is reducible to this one thing that really exists which is the material world. So what I want to understand is the chain of logic that you would use with quantum mechanics and consciousness to defeat this materialistic, only one thing exists, everything is reduced to material. So, as you've just said, the materialist uh, philosophy, worldview, 
says that consciousness, whatever it is, doesn't do anything. It's, it's inert, it's, it's passive, it's causally uh, ineffective. And uh, so insofar as you accept classical mechanics, that's the end of the story. And these people, these neuroscientists are basically right and you can't get around it. But why does a neuroscientist believe classical mechanics controls the brain? If you look at the details of what's going on in the brain, the nerve terminals and the flows of calcium ions in through ion channels and all these things that neurophysiologists talk about, at the bottom level, the processes are quantum mechanical. And in nonlinear systems, any uncertainties at the lower level magnify. And so you're, in principle, you've got to treat the brain quantum mechanically. Okay, so what are the implications of that? And if you treat the brain quantum mechanically, then you can look and see the, general, the quantum mechanical generalizations of the laws of classical mechanics. And all they do is determine potentialities for some event to happen. In order to make quantum mechanics work, you've got to have questions posed. And there's nothing in the laws of quantum mechanics, as we know them today and as they are applied, that determine what chooses the question. And what so, chooses the question. And that's, so that's where you add consciousness. And in actual practice, the thing that chooses the question, and the way it's used in practice, is the experimenter uh, has reasons for doing this and not that. There's a psychological process that causes him to do this and not that. So the way quantum mechanics actually gets around this problem that they have a part in it, namely the choice of the question, that's not determined by the laws as we know them, is to say the laws we know them deal with the physical realm. You need another process, which is consciousness. And if consciousness, and this gives consciousness an actual role to play and it allows consciousness to do something. And if consciousness, causally. Causally. And if consciousness can do something and does something, then materialism is out. But does that mean that consciousness is, is some kind of an independent stuff? Or a, you say, use the word process. I'm very carefully listening to process. Mm -hmm. uh, it, 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 it is uh, an independent process, which consciousness is, mm -hmm. let's say, mm -hmm. does that of itself defeat materialism? Because materialism is only one kind of stuff, the physical well, world. But you've also said that, that the psychological realm has, nothing, has no causal impact. And quantum mechanics. So once you once you make consciousness to have a causal impact, that defeats materialism. If you're posing that that consciousness has an independent existence, because if you would say, well, no, but the the point is that the laws of classical mechanics, the laws as generalized to quantum mechanics, do not answer this question that needs to be answered in quantum mechanics. So you need, you need another process. And in practice, this other process is, in fact, psychological. So quantum mechanics needs this process, which can be psychological and seem, seems to be psychological, described in those realms. And the physical description does not describe it. So you're forced to some other process. and. In fact, the only other sort of process we know is psychological, and in practice, it is psychological that the experimenter decides on the basis of his reasons to do something. But this psychological process is not just simply the product of the brain? And no, it, that's what I say. It cannot be the product of the brain, because the brain evolves according to quantum mechanical rules, and they just uh, uh, de describe the, the evolution of potentialities for an event to happen. That's all they describe. They don't describe what chooses the event that's going to happen. And this consciousness must therefore be an independent process that intervenes in a way. Um, in actual practice, in, in quantum mechanics, you say the experimenter chooses on the basis of his reasons for doing, for wanting to do. So, conceivably, if you look deeper and deeper, maybe you could somehow uh, tie it back in, but it won't tie into the, the quantum mechanical equations because the quantum mechanical equations 
only determine the potentialities. They don't determine the actual thing. So if you believe quantum mechanics, you are forced to something that's not this physical description. It's, it's outside that physical description. Quantum mechanics forces you to that. Nobody has seen how to make quantum mechanics work without having these choices come in. People have tried, but certainly there has been no successful way of getting around this, this fact that you've got to ask, that something has got to ask questions. So quantum mechanics demands a process that's not described by the generalization of the laws of classical mechanics. It is not described by this deterministic process that deals with physical properties. It demands a, a, a question. And it's not described in the physical reality. Therefore, uh, and the only, uh, and the way it actually works in practice is that it is, is described by a psychological process. So you, you need, you seem to need a psychological process. And certainly the physical process will not do the job. The physical process as we understand it in quantum mechanics will not do the job. Therefore, you need to say that consciousness is efficacious, it has effects, and if it has effects, then materialism is dead.